It's a book which is uh, extremely easy to read in a sense, a riveting read, but also has a huge amount of academic data behind it. David tells me that this evening we're going to get an exclusive preview of his, his update to so he's found a whole new set of data to add to his argument. Um, but I, I, just, just before we set up, um, David is going to do a, a presentation, we're going to have some Q&A afterwards. Um, I, I just say, I mean, it, it, is, it is rare for a serving politician these days to be able to find the time to write a book, and very, very rare for, for them to find the time to write such a very good book. I would really commend it to you all. It is a sensational piece of work. So it's a huge pleasure to have you here David, this evening. Over to you, and then uh, we'll do um, Q&A at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for that. And it's, uh, it seems right to be here with Policy Exchange, because although it's only six months ago that my book came out, <coughs> excuse me, it's actually almost five years ago that I first set out the arguments in that book uh, in a speech to Policy Exchange which was back in November 2005. And I argued then, and I'm quoting from that speech, it's not just that baby boomers have shaped the cultural environment, they've also shaped an economic and social environment that works for them very well. A young person could be forgiven for believing that the way in which economic and social policy is now conducted is little less than a conspiracy by the middle-aged against the young. <coughs> That's what I said five years ago. And as Policy Exchange generously gave me that opportunity then, it's right, I think, to come back now and review how the argument stands, and also, <coughs> and also to review what its implications are in particular for my own ministerial responsibilities for universities. So anyway, first of all, what we could call the rise of the boomer book, because uh, the book does seem to have struck a chord, it began five years ago when I delivered that speech as rather an eccentric and lonely battle arguing for the claims of the younger generation because I think we in Britain are very sensitive to arguments about unfairness on the grounds of class or ethnicity or income, but we just didn't seem very worried about unfairness between the generations. But that has started to change. And in fact, already since my book came out, we've had three more boom books. My book was followed by a manifesto for the election by Neil Borman entitled, It's All Their Fault, which states on the front page, and I quote, do your parents love you? Of course they do, but it hasn't stopped them robbing you blind. <laughs> he wanted all the boomers voted out of parliament with a few honorable exceptions. I survived his cull because I am, quote, a self-hating boomer. <laughs> but my colleague, Vince Cable, does far better as in Neil Gorman's parallel universe, Vince, quote, K, Vince Cable is Prime Minister. Uh, so it's a short and angry book, but I believe that young people are entitled to be angry. Next to appear is Francis Beckett's What Did the Baby Boomers Ever Do For Us? His argument is neatly summarised in the opening paragraph, and again I quote, the baby boomers saw themselves as pioneers of a new world, freer, fresher, fairer, and infinitely more fun. But they were wrong. The world they made for their children to live in is a far harsher one than is far harsher than the one they inherited. End of quote. He focuses on a cultural history of the group born in the first wave of the baby boom in the late 1940s and who shaped the 60s. His is more a personal account of how personal cultural account of how personal liberation has ended up eroding the values needed to live the good life. And he explicitly disagrees with my broader definition of the baby boom covering the period from 1945 to 65. And this gives me an opportunity to share with you, as my first slide, a chart which I wish I'd put in the book. It's quite simply the birth rate since the 1920s. And what you can see, I believe, that that chart contains more information about post-war Britain than any other single chart you can imagine. Uh, and you can see that there were indeed two peaks to the baby boom. Uh, first of all in 1947, secondly in 1964, followed by a dramatic fall in the birth rates reaching a low point in 1976. Those of you who want to 
ignore all the elaborate economic and social arguments in the book, might just care to note that there was a very cold winter in 1947 and 1963, an extremely hot summer in 1976. So maybe the best explanation of all this is meteorological. Anyway, uh, so there are, there are two peaks to the bay. However, even at the low point in the mid 50s, in between, the birth rate never really fell below 800,000 births a year in the UK. And it has hardly ever been above that rate at any other point. So I think, although there's no kind of objective rules here, I think one, you can understand why it seems needs to go from 45 to 65 as the, as the baby boom. But there were indeed two surges of young people. And my argument is the first surge of young people were indeed that baby boom in 47, the first peak. Those are the people who walked down Carnaby Street wearing psychedelic gear. And the second peak in the uh, early 60s are the people who rioted about the poll tax. So there were two surges of youthful uh, dynamism going into the economy, and they fed through it in different ways. And in turn, those young people surging into the jobs market made Thatcherite economic change possible. And I would also argue that if you want to know the demographic secret as to how Margaret Thatcher is able to bring down public spending, you have to realize that that's when all those baby boomers were in the middle of the workforce, working away. They had an older generation of pensioners that was very small in scale, as noticed, very low birth rate in the 1930s. So virtually no increase in the number of pensioners in the 1980s and early 90s. And behind them, a very dramatic fall in the birth rate. So not many children going through the education system. So an incredibly favorable environment holding down public expansion. Lots of taxpayers, fewer dependents on either side. Um, so that is one of the charts which I wish I'd put into the book, but I didn't. Um, now, I mentioned three books. I should mention a fourth book, which has just come out only last week. We had the launch, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to the launch. We had the launch of an excellent book, The Jilted Generation, How Britain Has Bankrupted Its Youth by Ed Hauker and Shiv Malik. They mount an argument very similar to mine with powerful evidence of the raw deal for young people in the jobs market, in housing, in pensions and savings. So boomer books are rapidly becoming a genre in their own right. I look forward to the day when we have our own section in Waterstones. <laughs> and, and I think that uh, we're beginning to win the argument because it so obviously chimes with everyone's day-to-day -day experience. That's why these books have struck a chord. In fact, some people have already started very shrewdly using my argument back at me. I've been told, for example, as science minister, that one of the best arguments for continuing to invest in science is that we are benefiting from the scientific discoveries <coughs> of previous generations and have a similar obligation to advance science for future generations. Now, the argument does have its critics, too. Some people felt that I was questioning the motives of the baby boomers, and well, I might come back to that later on in this presentation. But one reason for writing the book was I thought that part of the problem was that the baby boomers were just unaware. People had lost sight of the way the contract between the generations holds societies together. That was one reason we failed to stick to the basic terms of that contract. And they were unaware as well of how tough things were for the young generation as a whole. So my argument was if only we were once more to think about the position of successive generations, that itself would change the agenda. But now that people are once more becoming aware of the intergenerational ties that bind us, my optimistic view of the world is going to be tested. I had quite a few letters from members of the older generation who denied there was a problem, saying they'd had it far tougher than young people <coughs> nowadays. Some of them did not appear to like young people very much, <laughs> suggesting they'd brought any problems they had upon themselves. A few even wrote to David Cameron asking him to disavow my dangerous heresy, and I'm grateful to him for resisting the temptation. But I do want to comment briefly on the argument that the younger generation never had it so good. A sophisticated this proposition is Matt Ridley's book, The Rational Optimist. Um, now, Matt is a friend of mine, and his is a fascinating book, arguing that we should remain optimistic about the long-term prospects for humanity. He has faith in the dynamism of the free market and the free exchange of not just goods and services, but ideas too. And he's right about that. But the, and I do accept the mechanism of modern capitalism generating economic growth is not suddenly going to be turned off. Overall, GDP per head should continue to grow in the long term. 
However, I do believe that climate change, for example, is going to cause massive adjustment costs, so the higher GDP may not feed through into what we might regard as higher living standards. And above all, even as that growth continues, what will happen to the living standards of different age groups within society? Some will enjoy significantly higher living standards than others, and I fear there will be a clear generational divide. So let me just reinforce the argument with some new data that's become available since my book went to press. And I'm just very briefly going to take you therefore through some, some new figures, looking first at the jobs market and then at assets. This is a, a, an interesting chart, tracking the composition of the, the changing composition of employment. It shows change in employment levels based at 1992. Um, and you can see there has been a modest increase in total employment. It's at uh, second line down for people all aged, everyone aged over 16 and over. This is of people who are in employment. But within it, there has been a dramatic change with a significant increase in the proportion of employment enjoyed by people aged over 50, and a dramatic decrease in the proportion of employment represented by people aged under 24. So it does look as if there has been a change in the composition of the work towards older workers. There's also, I, I, and I came across this in some work done by the uh, CIPD, showing the effect of the, I think this following chart shows the effects of the recession. But it's about job satisfaction. Um, and it showed that as the recession hit, the level of job satisfaction amongst younger workers, and you might argue this is because they felt particularly vulnerable, they thought their jobs were most at risk, the level of job satisfaction amongst younger workers fell dramatically, whilst amongst older workers, perhaps feeling more secure, even in tough times, the level of job satisfaction did not fall anything like as much. So this seemed to me to some, be some kind of psychological evidence of the effect of the recession, particularly on younger people. So I thought that, um, and for those of you who studied the book, you'll recognize I have a chapter on these type of effects. So I think in terms of the distribution of opportunities in the labor market, here is, here is some more evidence reinforcing the argument that the times are particularly tough for the gen younger generation. Then there's the question of the distribution of assets, which I estimate at the book, and I realize and recognize it's an imperfect estimate, because it's surprisingly hard to get reliable figures for this, but there's roughly, in our country, 6.7 trillion pounds, 1,000 billion pounds of personal wealth divided into these different categories. Um, and I try to come up with a, uh, an estimate of how that wealth is distributed. And this, this table is in the book. My rough estimate, though drawing on the research of several people to whom I'm very uh, grateful, um, uh, on housing assets, drawing heavily on <coughs> mortgage lenders analysis, and Alan Holman's at Cambridge University, for example. That was my rough and ready estimate of pre-boomer, boomer, and 65-plus distribution of wealth. Because, of course, remember, it's very neat now if you define boomers as people born between 1945 and 1965, and, and the neatness of being 2010, they're the age group age between 45 and 65. Yeah. So, showing them only, I reckon, about half the wealth. Now, since then, we have got some new estimates, and the, I'm grateful to the Pensions Policy Institute for helping you here. Then. Here are some new estimates of housing wealth. Now, these are not, this, these are not perfectly comparable with the previous estimates. They're characterized in a different methodology. These are net figures, but they do show within this narrow age group, because these age groups are not the same size, um, this is 10 years or 15 years, 50 to pension age is 50 to 60 or 50 to 65, depending on whether you're a man or woman. A big concentration of the ownership of net housing wealth in that relatively small cohort. So again, it seems to reinforce the picture of this bulge in the middle where wealth ownership is concentrated. And we've also got here some new estimates of pension wealth. Again, we're well, grateful for the PPI who have now analyzed it. New Wealth and Asset Survey. Now again, this is not strictly comparable with my previous figures because this includes unfunded public sector uh, pension schemes. But again, a very dramatic bunching with 
all pension wealth enjoyed by people aged between 45 and 64, and uh, very little for the generations coming along behind. Now, of course, to some extent, this is a life cycle effect. If you work through the life cycle, you'd expect their pension wealth to build up and then fall down again. Um, build up as they say, and then decline as they start uh, consuming it. But I do not believe, and I think we all have very good reasons for accepting this, that the 25 to 34 year olds who currently, uh, there's 7.7 .7 billion there, 7.7 .7 million people who currently got 130 billion in pension wealth, most of which is in public sector pension schemes. But I, I think they are most unlikely in 20 years' time to be building up the kind of pension assets that the people 20 years older than them currently possess because they're not putting money into funded pension schemes and unfunded public sector pension schemes are also being reformed so they're less generous. So my view is that the, um, we have got some pretty clear evidence of the extra evidence in support of the arguments in the book. I speculate about the different reasons for the, uh, why this might have happened. And um, there's some other new bits of evidence, which is, uh, this is an attitudinal question, which I came across after the book went to press. And this is a slightly worrying one. If you think that demographics shapes attitudes to spending and tax, and this is a more, this is susceptible to a more cynical interpretation than me as one of nature's optimists would like to give, but this, you ask people of different age groups what should happen, what should adjust to pay for the, ri to the, for the rising cost of state pensions. And basically, young people say the value of the pension should fall. Uh, there's some people who agree that the pension age should be increased, and more likely to think that's pretty young if you're old. And the older you get, the more likely you are to think that taxes should be increased to pay for the <laughs> value, the increasing uh, cost of the pension. So this tells us that this is a cohort political attitude measure that I think may tell us something quite important about the future pattern of politics. So I wanted you to bring you up to date with some of the data. But now, let me uh, carry forward the argument by asking this rather tricky question. <laughs> um, what does the university's minister say to the author of the picture? And this is a question that's put to me uh, quite often in various ways. Now I have ministerial responsibility for universities. Um, am I in danger of breaching the principles set out in my own book? <laughs> the charge is that my generation had all the advantages of a free university education and are now taking it away from the younger generation. And this is obviously an argument that I take to heart. And this is the argument I'd like to discuss in the next section of my speech. Well, let me begin with the confessional. I went to university from 1975 to 1978. I recognized then, uh, I, looking back, I had no fee to pay, and as my parents had a modest income, I got a means-tested maintenance grant too. It was a more generous regime than students nowadays obtain. But uh, when I left university, we got the figures for 1979-80, then there were just over 320,000 young people at university. Now it's more like a million. And no government could have faced that surge in the number of students and kept a funding arrangement that was so generous per student. So my first reply to this challenge, therefore, is that higher education has expanded more than just about any other public service. And it is understandable that its financing has had to change with less support per student, even though there has been more for students in total. That's my first response. Secondly, even while we've seen this expansion, the returns from going to university remain good on average. The critics say that the so-called graduate premium has fallen. Indeed, there was an article in The Guardian by Aditya Chakraborty the other day pointing out that the estimates of a graduate premium of £400,000 years ago and that the estimates now ran at about £100,000. And so the argument goes there's been a catastrophic fall in the graduate premium. But this is to misunderstand the data. 
What has happened is that the methodology has changed. It's not that the premium has fallen. Uh, and the methodology has uh, improved over time. Um, we've got, we, as we become more sophisticated in trying to measure the extra earnings due to having a degree. The latest estimates, the £100,000 or so, take account of such things as tax, earnings forgone while studying, future earnings growth, the different likelihood of being unemployed according to qualification held. They also discount the present value of future earnings in today's money. The end of all this, uh, the end of all, the end result of all this indicates indeed that over his or her working life, the graduate should earn comfortably over £100,000 more in today's valuation, net of tax, more than a similar individual who achieved university entrance qualifications but did not go into higher education. There have been both internal and external studies that have looked at the graduate premium in recent years and they haven't all come up with exactly the same figure, but it has been in this range, 100,000 to 120,000, and they have shown that the premium has held up pretty well over the past few years. The claim that the graduate premium has fallen from £400,000 to £100,000 is factually wrong, as it is not comparing like with like. True, there was an early calculation of the lifetime earnings benefit to having a degree about 10 years ago. Within the then DFE, they did produce an estimate of around £400,000, and this did get some media coverage at the time. However, this was not using the methodology that I have outlined. It didn't take account of tax, it did not discount the earnings to put them in today's evaluation, and it compared graduates' earnings with average earnings across the whole population, not just with those with two or more ages. So that initial estimate of £400,000 has been replaced by the more sophisticated and more useful graduate premium calculation that we use today. So, that's my second response. So contrary to some of the fears, I understand how on a quick reading of the evidence you might think is for the 400,000 to 100,000 calculation is not valid. But then there's the third. <clears throat> the crucial test is surely what the student is getting for their money. I believe we should focus on the fair deal for the student. <coughs> this was Labour's mistake in 2004. At the time they promised, and I quote Charles Clark, hundreds of millions of pounds for vice chancellors to spend on improving the quality of teaching and to compete with the best universities. Anywhere. But they did not put in place any mechanism to ensure that happened with the extra money they collected in fees. And although some of the money has gone into better labs, too much has gone on in just on unjustified pay increases or keeping running an unreformed pension system. In fact, it was a classic <laughs> example of Labour putting in money without reform. As the money came from fees, it looked like a market reform, but they did not then deliver the structural reforms that were necessary to ensure that the investment was in teaching. This time, I'm determined that supply-side reform is going to be a key part of the deal. My third reply, therefore, is that the real challenge for any future reform is whether it improves the incentives for universities to focus on the quality of the student experience. We need to ensure that there are strong incentives for universities to focus on better teaching of students. And the most effective way is supply-side reform. And I'm committed to this and pay tribute to Policy Exchange, which shares this long-standing commitment going right back to when I was shadowing education years ago. It remains crucial to education reform at all stages, and Michael Gove and I share a commitment <coughs> to this agenda. And a lot is happening in higher education. Already we have a thousand places in clearing this year from the new BPP University College. And one particular mechanism I suggested for supply side reform, new institutions, new teaching institutions, teaching an external degree, is already bearing fruit with Kaplan's announcement last month that it will offer 600 places full, for full-time stu students to study in London towards accountancy, business, economics and finance degrees that will be examined and awarded by the University of London. So my reply to the author of the pinch comes in three parts. First, we have many more students. It would not have been possible to keep the old, generously financed elitist system. Secondly, we've seen the graduate premium maintained. It has not fallen. In fact, what seems to have happened is that the demand for graduates has increased along with the supply. Public policy does not always work like this. 
and we should be pleasantly surprised when we manage to maintain an equilibrium in this way. And thirdly, there is a challenge to ensure that students get a fair deal, especially with a renewed focus on teaching and the academic experience. This is where supply side reform comes in. Now let me now turn to the life cycle and the age cohort, because there are some important further points here about education. I argue in the book that the welfare state, to understand the work of the welfare state, we have to distinguish between the life cycle and the age group. By and large, the, ta the state taxes people who are middle-aged when their earnings are high to help them when they're young and when they're old. And in a perfect equilibrium, and I argue that because of their size, the boomers have broken this equilibrium, but in a stable state equilibrium, you receive from the welfare state when you're young, where capital markets are still imperfect, a toddler can't walk into a bank and borrow all the money necessary for a 20-year education. So the state finances your education when you're young, you put in, you pay your taxes in middle-aged, and you take out again when you're old through pensions and also through the NHS, more than half of healthcare going to pensions. So that is a stable model of what um, the welfare state does. And it's relevant to the education debate. Full-time students do not have to pay their fees out of their own resources up front. They borrow the money to repay it when they're graduated and are in better paid jobs. Vince and I, Say that a lot nowadays. <laughs> Vince, and I, Vince and I have focused on the higher contributions which are likely to be paid by graduates as the system is reformed. At the moment, students pay off their loans when they're in their late 30s. If in some way they are expected to make a bigger graduate contribution, this could take the form of their having to pay back for their university education for longer out into their 40s. This is to shift a cost onto a time when they're likely to have much higher earnings than they did as students. In fact, it's a shift in the payment even further away from the student stage of the life cycle. And let me focus on another life cycle effect, which is not remarked upon as much as it ought to be. Given that most people in education are young, education and spending is a shift towards the young. So far, so obvious. But you can also shift resources within that educational life cycle itself. So if you shift resources towards, say, early years and away from colleges and universities, then you are redistributing within the education life cycle itself. And the latest <coughs> figures from the OECD show how we balance this out in Britain compared with other advanced figures. Let me quote with the OECD figures from Education at a Glance 2010. UK expenditure on total education, pre-primary to tertiary, is 5.8% of GDP against a population weighted OECD total of 6.2%. And within that, broken down between the micro stages of your education, we devote 0.3% of GDP to pre-primary. That's actually defined by the OECD as for the three-year-olds and over, against the OECD average of 0.4%. When it comes to primary and lower secondary, which I think goes up to 14, we devote 2.8% of GDP to primary and lower secondary against the OECD average of 2.5%. When it comes to upper secondary education, we devote 1.5% of GDP to upper secondary education as against 1.1% in the OECD as a whole. And when it comes to tertiary education, we devote 1.3% of GDP to tertiary education against the OECD average of 2.0%. So we have got a rather different distribution of resources within the educational life cycle than the OECD average. So, there is a fascinating debate to be had about how governments can best redistribute resources across the life cycle. We tend to see this as young v old, but it's also young young as against not quite so young. And as a vivid example of this, the last Labour government, at the very same time as they increased for uni fees for universities, delivered a big increase in tax finance provision for early years. <coughs> and this, I think, is an interesting issue, which means to, which I hope to return to at a later date. So. 
Let me conclude with some wider observations about the politics of all this and how it relates to the role of government. Uh, sometimes conservatives are told that we're told that we lack any kind of account of the state. If we had our way, so the caricature goes, and it is a caricature, there wouldn't be any public spending at all, apart from the traditional security roles of the state through armed forces and police. This is by no means a full account of what government does. Conservatives also understand that the state shifts resources across the life cycle. This is what families do and what our key public services, notably health and education, do as well. We need to continue to ensure there is a fair balance here. And when we link different stages of the life cycle like this, we're also linking different generations. Politics is about more than just the interests of one generation, it's about a fair balance among them. And for example, our plans to reduce the budget deficit are sometimes seen, even by those who recognize the necessity, as particularly hard on the young, but tackling the deficit is the best single way of helping them. It was the point of that great pre-election post with the picture of the baby, Dad's nose, Mom's eyes, Gordon Brown's death. The economic death consequences of not getting to grips with the deficit would hit the young generation <coughs> hardest and longest. And what I believe, and this is what my final few slides are about, is the importance of the contract between the generations. Because I believe that the contract between the generations is what makes a big society. And let me conclude with this picture as to why this contract is particularly vulnerable in Britain and why I believe there is evidence that we're simply unaware of and have lost contact with other generations. This is a euro survey asking people across Europe if they think there are enough opportunities for older and younger people to meet and work together. And you can see that in the UK, agreement that there are not enough opportunities is strongest and the net figure of 76% stronger than somewhat agreeing is the uh, largest figure in any one nation state. So we have in Britain, for reasons again I go into in the book, rather less contact between the generations and a greater feeling there should be more contact than in most other advanced European states. And we can see the consequences of a loss of contact in a loss of trust. I think the following question brings out, as I think one of the most vivid measures of the loss of trust that I've come across, a much, adults in Britain, much more wary of intervening with 14-year-olds than in either Germany or Spain if they saw them vandalizing a bus shelter. And the, the thought experiment is, um, which is, uh, comes from an American writer, it's not uh, uh, an original thought, the thought experiment is to imagine a group, ask a group of people, of people in this room tonight, imagine that you are the board of directors of a forestry company, and you've got a patch of woodland, and uh, you are uh, planning to cut down the trees. And then people try out some arguments on it. The first argument is this, people say to you, uh, you will maximize the profits of your forestry business if you delay cutting down the woodland now and wait for a few years when you'll get a bigger return and appeal to economic rationality. And some members of the board are persuaded by that argument. You then do a second question. You say, okay, there's this patch of woodland, but the patch of woodland is enjoyed as an amenity by people in the neighborhood. Please, out of a sense of obligation to your community, don't cut the trees down. And again, some people invited to play the role of the members of the board of directors say, all right, we better not cut the trees down. Then you put them a third question. You say, the only reason you've got this patch of woodland is because previous generations left it for you, and you have an obligation to leave it in a similar state for future obligations. That argument people understand. That is by far the most powerful argument in shifting the behavior of people that are asked to imagine in the board of directors of the forestry company. So in other words, the pattern of conventional politics, either the appeal to rational self-interest, argument one, or the appeal to horizontal equity, social obligations, argument two, neither of them 
strikes the same emotional chord as that appeal to fairness between generations, argument three. That's what I believe the politics should be about, and it's about valuing the long term, and I think it is a crucial proposition for the coalition in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Thank you very much. Stuff, David, and um, so much to think about that. Uh, we've got a little bit of time now for questions and answers, I think. Um, I, I wonder if I could be, uh, ask you all if you, when you put up your hand, to say who you are and where you're from as well. Take them around the room. I wonder if I could lead off. So, I've talked a little bit about like you the graduate premium, the number of uh, people who now go to university. Would, would it be such a terrible thing if the graduate premium were gone? Surely that is an indicator of an undersupply of graduates and a, a social opportunity that's not being grasped. Uh, that is a fair point. You could argue, if you were, uh, some economists would say that um, you should increase the number of uh, graduates up until the point at which the graduate premium would be completed down to zero. That would be a one argument. Um, there are other issues about how much uh, we can um, afford by way of participation in higher education and um, the nature of how the higher education experience would change with a further expansion. But that is an argument that some people could put. And okay, and there are a couple of questions in the front row for sir, and then uh, you. Okay. Oh, there's, there's a microphone coming down towards you. Okay, stop it. I'm Rob Dowler, I'm from the Industry Forum and also the Council of <laughs> Science and Engineering. And a little word um, in favour of the baby boomers. Could I ask you if you've actually done what I call an intergenerational <coughs> cash flow analysis? Because I'd be pretty prepared to bet that if you did that for the next 50 years, you would see a transfer of wealth <coughs> from the boomer generation, the generation X and Y, at two to three trillion pounds. Okay, by the simple fact of the mortality and inheritance of property. Um, and I think you'll find that that fairly neatly fills the whole <coughs> of the um, pension deficit. Um, for Generation X and Y. And I think, therefore, if you analyse the experience of Generation X and Generation Y, and I speak as a father, the one of each, um, over that whole period, you will find actually they've had their high um, instance of, of university education, they've had their gap years, they've had their nice spending in bars and expensive cocktails, and they'll end up with as much wealth as we did. So I, I think you'll find actually, if you do a whole life cycle analysis, um, they haven't done very bad, very badly. And in fact, the contract for the generation stands up between the boomers and X and Y, it stands up pretty well. Okay. Well, there is a, a kind of entire literature on that, which I kind of, um, I just draw on for the book. Uh, but the reason why it may not, and there are lots of response to that. One response to that is, it is possible that the, well, imagine that, um, when the baby boomers were young, a house cost an average £100,000. And that because of house price inflation and policy exchange again are eloquent about the housing issue, imagine the average price of a house is now £250,000. If the baby boomers had just realised this was an entirely paper thing and we're going to pass on a £250,000 house to the next generation, Let's just let's assume away all the problems of sort of social division and everything, then uh, that could indeed work. If, however, you think that this increase in the value of your house from £100,000 to £250,000 is some reflection of your econ extraordinary economic skill and personal virtue, <laughs> I think the obvious thing to do is to convert some of this increase in the value of your house, house into spending money now. And so you have what you do is you end up with a £150,000 mortgage, which you've used to raise your living standards. And when you die, and this is a crucial stage of the argument, when you die, your mortgage is not fully paid off, which I think is going to be the future for the baby boomers. And your children inherit a £100,000 to pay for a house that costs £250,000. At that point, one generation has ridden the house price boom to enjoy high living standards and has dumped its problems on the next generation. That is what I fear is happening 
And then, of course, secondly, there are all the issues about, insofar as these transfers are individual, whether you are into a caste society where the transmission of the wealth is hereditary. And that is a gross simplification of quite a big economic argument, but I think there is a lot of proper economists and econometricians would argue that what I described is what's happening. From Serco, I run the NHS insurance services business. Um, that was that was absolutely fascinating, and I think just one point, then a question. Uh, and the point really was that I was listening to a radio program where someone else, I think, who'd written one of these baby boomer books, actually referred to the the second peak as baby gloomers because mm. we're all carrying our parents and our children. And I have to say, I had an awful lot of sympathy for that because I think uh, I think that's a, perhaps slightly different. Um, but it, it comes back really to the issue around university places because I think one of the things you said was very fundamental. We have all gone through enjoying that ability to access university. If we matriculated, achieved the entrance qualifications, we were able to go. And whilst I understand absolutely what you're saying about the money not being unlimited, um, I, I genuinely believe that there are much, much better ways to spend it. I cannot understand why the cost of a university education is as it is when you actually look at the contact time, the face-to-face -face time, etc. And indeed, the fact that the, the new BPP places can be delivered without subsidy for the same cost as, a, as, a, as a, an individual would have to pay for their tuition fees at a state university. I, I think there must be something in there around bringing the cost down of the university degree. Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, uh, certainly there is a problem of getting universities to focus on teaching. There was a very uh, dismal survey amongst university academics asking them what they thought um, improved their chances of getting promotion. And top of the list was excellence in research. Second was administrative competence in helping the running of the department, and third and last on the list was teaching students. So, and this is not an accident, this is a result of the set of financial incentives we've constructed and the very sharp incentives to reward research, research assessment exercise, and obviously the weak incentives on teaching. And so, yeah, I do want to try, if we can, and we'll see what emerges from Lord Brown, to shift so that there are better incentives for teaching and status for teaching and teaching the transmission of a body of knowledge from one generation to the next is an incredibly worthwhile activity and should be celebrated in universities in its own way. One last question from the front here before we go back. Thank you very much. Richard Jackal, the concerned youth member of the electorate, Gen Y as well, third on my tag on the on the questions list. So we were sold by Labour the absolute lie that 50% of students going to university would be do wonders for us. Oh yes, more employment, absolutely. More, as you say, increase in demand for graduate posts, etc. There's also more supply. So you also indicate that the premium uh, has not dropped. You know, you will earn more if you go to university. That can be celebrated, but more than that, sir, what should be looked at is an indictment that has occurred. If you do not go to university, where are you left? Absolutely, that is vitally important. So hand-wringing aside, what my generation will want to see and what we shall see as we enter the labor market successfully and build wealth, etc., is not the previous generation wringing their hands and feeling sorry for themselves or us, but rather, as we uh, ascend to power, we want to see your generation trying to make amends and say, you know what, university isn't the only way to get a good education in life and a good outcome in life. Yep. Do you agree? Uh, I, do, I do agree that we have ended up with university being seen as the, the only route uh, into a, a well-paid job and a successful career. And the other week, as you passed on the day, the you know, results came in, listening in on some of the phone calls. There were young people absolutely distraught who thought if they hadn't got to 
to you there, to their preferred university or not place in university at all, kind of just like all the doors that matter in life are being slammed shut in their face. And we have got, and I think British society is unusual in this model of it, where this going to university is the, the only way through, and it's why alongside university, uh, we, one of the things the coalition government is trying to do, yes and I again, is uh, uh, invest in apprenticeships, reward apprenticeships, and uh, also professional routes. There used to be routes into professions like accountancy that didn't depend on going to university. And some of the accountancy firms are once more uh, uh, investing in those routes. Often they involve doing some part-time study. Often these routes involve some HG, and I think many apprentices, some apprentices might go on to HG. But yes, this idea that you have to go away from universe, from home to university for three years, aged 18, there are other ways into adulthood, and we should uh, invest in them and value them as well. Right, so some questions a bit further back, and uh, lots of them. Uh, but probably take Sam Britton. <laughs> Um, something I came late that I haven't read most of your book. I wonder, and it's a really good book, but in some ways it's a trap because there's so much incidental information and I have to ask myself what the main thesis is. And I want you to tell me if I've got it right. And if so, I may have further uh, questions. <laughs> that the, what you call baby boom generation will be a larger proportion of the population and its predecessors. And secondly, they will live longer. And the net effect of that is a, tra is a proportional transfer of income and wealth, uh, greater than in earlier eras, uh, from other people to them, coming about either from state entitlements or from their own pensions and other sources of income. Have I got that right? That is part of the argument, yes. So, uh, <laughs> he said warily, because I... But, so, so, yeah, but follow up, follow up on him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not asking you to prescribe a remedy here and create a crisis in the government. Uh, but, <laughs> oh, conceptually, I mean, I suppose I start out from macro economics rather than micro. Supposing we want to do something about it, you, you, you can make transfers at any one time, but I don't see how you can transfer income from one generation to people coming in 20 years' time or, or going backwards. Uh, it's a sort of time travel which I don't understand. Now you can make uh, all sorts of assumptions about if you reduce the budget deficit, uh, we'll save more, invest more, become richer, or you can say it'll lead to a slump. But without going into these economic imponderables, how do you transfer uh, from you know, income from one? Well, they all feel guilty if you'd like them to. How do they transfer income from one generation to the next? Right. Um, well, there is. I think there are several things one could. You know, you're right. The book is not as that kind of ten point plan. Right? Um, for a variety of reasons. I wanted it to be an argument rather than a list of policy proposals. And anyway, writing uh, as a member of the Shadow Cabinet, my party's policies were so perfect that nothing could be either added to <laughs> or subtracted from them. Uh, but uh, what you could, I mean, two examples of your proposition is you can leave behind more kit. You can, you can invest in kit that lasts quite a long time. Now, as you are, I've learned at your feet, and you can have real investment can be occasionally <coughs> appalling waste of resources. But by and large, if you look at Britain, uh, we have, I would argue, we are the beneficiaries of kit left by previous generations. The Victorians didn't say, let's build a sewage system out of plaster of Paris in the last 25 years, and then there'll be richer generations along who can replace it with something better. A lot of, we're the beneficiaries of previous generations endowing us with kit that was designed to live a very, to last a very long time. Are we similarly providing infrastructure for future generations. And there's the other form of, of infrastructure, human capital, education. What kind of level of education are we endowing the future gen younger generation with? Those, I would argue, are the kinds of transfers. There are issues as well about housing and all that. I think policy makes <coughs> a really excellent contribution to the debate. So there are um, 
making it easier for uh, younger people to get into affordable housing by making it easier for houses to be built would be a third example. So I do think there are things that can be done. Um, and perhaps if my party had not uh, formed the government, I'd have written volume two of the, the ten point plan. But I think those are the kind of things. Thanks, Pam. David, I'd just like to ask you a question about HB social class. Uh, conceding, I've got to say that since your boomer generation is so wide, I obviously fit into it. Um, and there wasn't too much psychedelic clothing in the North Shields, I can tell you. Um, but if you look at HB social class, um, how far, which would you come down on the side of as, in terms of the determined regard to social mobility, which is a goal of the coalition? And the other question I've got is if we're really concerned about the younger generation, people coming on from my generation, how far is there a risk that public funding is going to be substituted for, by an expectation of private contribution, for example, higher fees, don't do what you say about supply side in terms of universities, but higher fees are anticipated by the Treasury in order to substitute for the public funding that we have had to date. Well, Pam, we have lots of conversations about higher education. Um, I mean, on your second part, your, uh, I mean, we just have to, we'll have to see what John Brown proposes, uh, but I do accept that in, in tough times fiscally, part of uh, part of what he is likely to propose and what we're likely to have to do is to expect a larger contribution in some way from graduates. So that's, um, it's obviously a debate that we had about the way that should be done and how it can be best be fair. On your first point about age and class, I mean, there are both um, dimensions. I would argue the trouble is that they, they are kind of two dimensions and um, we all understand that the intergenerational transmission of advantage or disadvantage is a key uh, way in which we have to understand poverty and deprivation in our country. Uh, so I would argue that it's the, uh, the, real, the, the real driver is that we are trying to, if we try to help the next generation one by one, which is an admirable instinct, nothing wrong with it, is what parents wish to do with their kids. But if we try to help the next generation one by one, and don't, as a society, as a whole, offer a fair deal for the younger generation as a whole, then the consequence is very low levels of social mobility and high levels of inequality. So that you, the way in which you can break that transmission mechanism is trying to offer a fairer deal for the younger generation as a whole, alongside <coughs> an understandable efforts for <coughs> parents to do the best for their own kids. Very good. And uh, there's a lady about halfway back up on this. Helen Rob, um, consultant at um, Prospect Wealth Management. I, mean, I think you touched on the first thing that I was going to ask is the distribution within the richer age band, and just how that pans out. And is the implication of what you've been saying is that currently richer pensioners probably have to do more for themselves than thinking, I'm over 60, 65, I can claim X, Y, Z. And is it also an argument that you don't really actually, should we think about transferring assets to the next generation or death and making it easier? For those people who have the wealth to pass it on, or does that really come unstuck because of the distribution of wealth within the, within that age band? Um, it does. It does indeed uh, remind us that there will be some pensioners who are um, quite affluent, and I think one of the reasons for sort of raising the pension age and all that is to try to. Because they and they tend to be the younger ones is to try to um, address that. 
I also think that I didn't make much of it. And the, uh, Sorry, Dave, I was said pensioners, but possibly I should have meant baby boomers, right? right. You know, 45 right. to 65. Yeah. And they are, in terms of what they should, they should do, I mean, I think oddly enough, I didn't make much of it in the book. Um, there is probably two sort of clever, clever. There is actually an argument here for the George Osborne inheritance tax proposal, which is that if you think that the key decision for an older person or person building up who's built up those assets that I described is a trade-off between consuming them now, going back to that original example of, okay, I've got this house and it's worth 250,000, I'm gonna run a nice big fat mortgage. Between consuming the money yourself or not consuming it so that the next generation inherit it unencumbered, then lowering the rate of inheritance tax shifts the incentives from consumption to non-consumption. So you could argue that that is, now it doesn't attack all the sort of the fact that you're solving this, this is a one by one solution of the interest of the next generation rather than a society-wide solution. But you could argue that it does change that decision in favor of non-consumption. Uh, and the, uh, the less that the wealth of the old people is encumbered, the less the burden for the younger generation who inherit. There's a gentleman here in the uh, middle with a red jumper. Uh, Michael Johnson. Um, uh, hello, it's Michael Johnson. Um, I shall now think of you as a sort of demographic Robin Hood. Um, <laughs> and I'll be extremely wary if you get anywhere near the Treasury. <laughs> um, two questions. Whilst you were writing the book, did you ever find your brain drifting towards the question of the potential parallel between public sector pensions? And everyone else. And secondly, um, the point about that we're just making about related to inheritance tax. Um, one proposal that I've made through another think tank, I won't name it in this or in this situation, is the idea that we should trans uh, permit the transfer of pension assets um, free of inheritance tax and seven-year-olds and all the rest of it, provided that that asset transfer goes within pension framework of the recipient, so that one creates a generational cascade of wealth, free of the clutches of whoever happens to be in number 11. Yeah. Um, I, I think public sector pensions is in indeed one aspect of this issue, uh, it certainly is, and uh, uh, it was one of the, it's one, not the only one of the drivers of the uh, long-term deterioration of public finances that the Treasury uh, captured some of their long-term fiscal trends documents there and I'm gradually piecing it together often rather hiding the scale of the problem. On your second thought, that is an interesting debate to be had because, and there are a variety of ideas around a kind of family fund which would indeed protect <coughs> intergenerational transfers within a family group. And, in, and you could, uh, and uh, if you, and there's quite a tricky quest, policy question there. If you think that what really matters, it, it's always better to pass something on to the next generation. You know, you are just doing it one by one within the family, then you, that's a very attractive model. And indeed, it is much more how continental systems operate. French laws of inheritance that have recently been reformed a bit, that I discussed them briefly in chapter one a classic example of protecting the, regarding assets as not the absolute property of one generation, but essentially held in trust for the family as a project across many generations. But part of the reason for my opening chapter, which is about our family structure, was to argue that England, in particular, has been less, has historically been less dependent on this type of personal transfer of parents to, to children. We were actually often rather cool towards our own kids. And that uh, what you really had as the kind of birthright of an English man and woman was participation in a free and open system. Uh, and that the 
Uh, in England, we always had really very ousted rights of property, and it was you know, not just through primogeniture, large numbers of kids dearly did not extract much from it. And this was a rather well, important feature of our economy. So I will freely admit, I don't, don't discuss in the book, I think it might have been one of the chapters if I'd ever done a volume two, who knows, it may have the future, but there is quite a tricky trade-off. It clearly does change, incent improves incentives for saving, but only within the family, so you could argue that it is that it is good for intergenerational transfers, but bad for social mobility. Um, this question, gentlemen, pink shirt, Thank you. Uh, Tim Loynick from the London School of Economics, born 1971. Uh, I welcome the fees entry into the university sector. I'm all in favour of competition and fair fees. But fair fees don't have to be low fees, as any Mercedes-Benz dealer will tell you. Given that my international students are happy to be paid, are happy to pay £10,000 a year to be taught by me and my colleagues, wouldn't it be fair to allow me to charge my British students that sort of sum so that I could have a well-warranted pay rise? <laughs> <laughs> Rarely has the argument for higher fees been put so persuasively and stuck in front of you the higher pay rise. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Tim, certainly you, uh, I, there is sometimes these discussions, you have a slight flavour of Alcoholics Anonymous where people have to begin by confessing the generation to which they belong. Um, well, the question is whether, for the younger generation, your proposition would be seen as a fair proposition. And, uh, there are a set of issues about how you would, how they would have to expect to pay, whether they uh, do they can't pay up front, how the payments are to be made down the track, how you ensure that people from poorer backgrounds are not deterred, how you are to be confident that this uh, income for universities is um, uh, is spent on is spent in a competitive environment, so it does actually reward and increase teaching incentives. So. Uh, there are, it's not quite as straightforward as you make it sound in your seductive way, but we are looking forward to John Brown's report on golf subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a gentleman in a purple tie in the middle of the Good evening, Ian McKenna from Anson Technology Research Centre. Um, do you believe that um, if the baby, boom, baby boomer generation has written a somewhat generous set of legislation towards itself, when Generation Y comes to power, they will feel obliged to honour that legislation, or indeed may they rewrite the rules more to their own interests. Well, that is a very important point. Um, it's the it's summarising that great American bumper sticker: "Be nice to your kids; they choose your nursing home." <laughs> and the other part of the argument is indeed, and there is a, uh, it's a bit, uh, is indeed that the baby boomers have to watch out because the table will, uh, the table will at some point be turned, and the, there are ways in which, uh, however powerful and affluent baby boomers look now, they could find, uh, in some way or other, a younger generation that doesn't feel any obligation, that feels they have get their own back in. And we can speculate about the mechanisms. One mechanism, of course, is inflation, uh, which uh, uh, might uh, erode the value of the paper savings. They're not obviously the real assets of, of the people. So yeah, there is a risk. And uh, whether, whether a future working population, people who feel they had a raw deal, is willing to sustain levels of tax and spending that are implied by the previous government's own long-term fiscal trends is a, is the key question. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a gentleman, can I open the row next to the Hello, uh, Ben Anderson, leech on society, otherwise known as a civil servant. <laughs> uh, speaking in a personal capacity, um, my father was the youngest of five children and made the least money out of those five over his lifetime. But in their extended family, um, there's been rather a lot of uh, nastiness regarding money and inheritance and everything else. So this nice idea of, sort of wealth cascading down the, the generations. What happens when there's somebody who's coming to the end of their life and they don't like the decisions that their, their child made in terms of who they married or one of them was a drug addict for a few years and then decided 
they decide they don't deserve this money and, and so on. I mean, isn't there real problems there when you start mix the idea of equity through the generations being very one-to-one? -one? Like you talked about earlier on in the gentleman now in the beginning. But the very first question, which I thought, well, one problem is not everybody has rich parents. So, well, uh, there is, as always, there is there's some American research. Which I'm, I'm trying to remember the piece of research. I don't think I cited it. There's a piece of research which, if I recall, tries to measure the time devoted to their parents by children, depending on how many children there are. And the argument was that you might expect that when there are more children, the amount of time they would devote to the parents would fall because there were more to divide the work up. But the argument is that actually there is no significant reduction in the amount of time for the child because there is competition between the children as to who is best placed to enjoy the inheritance. And it was a, I can't remember where I read it, but there is a, there is a, I don't know, there was a piece of American social science research that tried to test your proposition and didn't come up with it. It looked to me as a lame um, evidence of that kind of, uh, of the kind of competition you describe. And this question is right towards the back. Tell me the booster. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Mark Holland, a social policy student. Um, I'd just like to ask about one of the biggest challenges in Swiss society uh, in the next few years, which is going to be about uh, how we fund elderly care. Uh, do you think that there is an argument to say that the baby boomers uh, are yet to contribute enough of their life cycle uh, in order to uh, benefit from um, the uh, NHS uh, in their elderly time and uh, should it be that that generation uh, should fund uh, their, their elderly care and their life? Um, well, <coughs> the if, if it is possible for the uh, older generation, if, if it can be achieved for them to fund it, that would be, that would lower the costs on subsequent generations. Um, but as you know, we in the coalition government have got a, a, a review of how that should be done. Um, but insofar as it can be done by older people uh, funding themselves, and that you need the right kind of incentives and rewards, then that would ease the <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, William Archer, I graduate. I want to raise a, a, another pinch, uh, which is uh, in the news today around net migration, uh, just to get your views on whether if we're, if we're generally recognising that the wealth of the nation is enhanced by international education, is the answer going to be to get more of our British students to go and study in other countries? or to reduce the numbers coming here, uh, whether at degree level or not? Or are we perhaps being a little simplistic in terms of setting a net migration target in the first place? Well, I think almost at the same time as I was delivering that speech, Damien was delivering uh, his uh, speech, Damien Green, his excellent speech on uh, migration issues. Um, the, the uh, and on that, of course, he would first of all say that some of the problems that he identifies in his speech do not arise from students going to mainstream English colleges and universities, so that people who are going to places that we would not recognise as in any way part of the mainstream HE or FE sector. Uh, but secondly, I do think that, as you rightly point out, it is a net figure. And the when I was in India with the Prime Minister on his tour in the end of July, the one of the statistics that struck me was that there are, I think, 40,500 Indian students coming to study in Britain, and there are 500 British students going to study in India. And there it was, when you look at the British students are sadly very reluctant to go and study abroad, they don't like speaking foreign language, they like, want to go to places that are sunny, and on most of the demanding tests which seem to be set by British students, you know, going to study in India actually scores quite highly, and in, we do know from employers they rather like, they think your employability is improved if you have got some experience of studying in another country. Uh, and so I would be, and I discussed with the Indian Education Minister, ways in which we could make this more a two-way flow, 
uh, and encourage more young people to go and study in India. That in turn means some quite hard work. My officials are talking to his officials about things like ensuring that there is mutual recognition so that the year of study that you do at an Indian university counts towards your degree at a, at a British university. But if you can make that work, uh, recognising our education is going global, we get a proper two-way flow, then I think um, we gain all round. Right. Good evening, Mr. My name is Dan Kaplan. I hold for a public affairs company in this public affairs, but I, I should also declare I was a parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party at the last election. Um, I want to ask you two questions, really, quite shortly. Um, one, do you believe in a small estate? And two, do you believe in a gradual tax? Do I believe in a uh, small estate? I do think that. Uh, we should uh, bring down the overall burden of uh, tax and public spending. But I think it is very hard to do when you see the demographic trends that we face on a kind of 40 year view. Uh, the, the environment, instead of having a tailwind as we had in the 1980s, we've now got a headwind. And I wanted a try and book to explain what that is. <laughs> on the graduate tax, well, um, we, there are a range of ways in which we could uh, finance higher education in the future. John Brown is looking at them. I think a, <laughs> I think a full blown if a full blown graduate tax uh, is very unlikely to be uh, emerge as his proposal. But I don't think uh, when Vince asked him to look at ways of in which you could have a graduate contribution, I don't think. Vince was envisaging a full-blown graduate tax um, because some of the criticisms that have been made at that are um, like the issue of whether you create an incentive for people to emigrate, I think are a genuine issue. But just to pick up on the graduate tax point, the only thing that's fairer for a graduate to know that they can pay off their debt and move on with their life and have a tax hanging over them for the rest of their life. Uh, well, there are a, a range of arguments. What we, what, uh, we want is to make it clear that this is a contribution that people pay back when they are graduates. Uh, and of course that contribution is already collected by the tax system as a percentage of your earnings above £15,000. Um, but as I say, I mean, and I, the coalition government has not taken a final view on this. We are waiting for John Brown's report, but I, said, I think a full-blown full blown tax, which could potentially mean that you paid many multiples back compared with the cost of your education. I think that is on that. Gentlemen, right in the middle here, <coughs> front of the third row, we'll just come round. Um, Charles Alexander, business executive. Um, in your speech, uh, David, you put up a great chart saying that the um, solution to the pinch would involve the big society or it would be an expression of the big society. Apart from the fact that you feel obliged to say this, <laughs> um, you didn't seem to elaborate on that connection in your, in your spoken words. What did you mean? What I meant in that final part of my speech was that I do think that a very, a very sort of, a very valuable way of thinking of the social contract is to think of it as the contract between generations. And Tories, and the book is deliberately not written as a kind of partisan text, but Tories are sometimes rather wary of the language of the social contract. But I think if you, if you think of it as a contract between the generations, um, then the Conservatives uh, may be rather more comfortable with it. And uh, my view is that what kind of holds the society together is that uh, contract between the generations. And I might even give you a quick burst of Edmund Burke. I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with this. Let me find, see if I can find the best quote. There's a lovely extract. Um, let's find the page. Uh, uh, yeah, can I give a quick burst of Edmund Burke? Just to raise the tone. Society, society is indeed a contract. 
Subordinate contracts for objects of mere occasional interest may be dissolved at pleasure. But the state, is interesting, but the state ought not to be considered as nothing better than a partnership agreement in a trade of pepper and coffee, calico or tobacco, or some other such low concern to be taken up for a little temporary interest and to be dissolved by the fancy of the parties. It is to be looked on with other reverence because it is not a partnership in things subservient only to the gross animal existence of a temporary and perishable nature. It is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the ends of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. And that, I think, is a very good statement of how the contract between the generations contributes to the big society. And there was a living perfect room. I'm Greta Shirinina. Congratulations on an excellent book. I think it's quite exceptional. Um, what strikes me is you, your final couple of pages. You talk about the appeal of the narrative and picking up on the um, big society. What strikes me is that there has been no talk about the, the intergenerational issues because the younger generation are facing a fiscal burden. They are um, a smaller cohort. There are demographic um, they are, dem they, they are demographically disadvantaged, advantaged. but also, just going back to that graph you showed, they don't have, in these early years, in their 20s, they are unlikely to have the same level of job securities that, that the baby boomers have enjoyed as well. Yeah, and I agree with you. I do think myself is a very powerful narrative. And um, in their book, Jilted Generation, um, I think you'll see that I think that is developed very well. Uh, it's kind of what, it's, what kind of people are we? Are we just, and this one of the points of my example, of people imagine they're poor, they're in the Park Street. Imagine if it, it, it's getting people to attach a meaning to their lives that is more than simply consuming today, and a, appeal to the interests of future generations, and the sense that you are both beneficiaries of an inheritance and have an obligation to pass something on, I think is a very powerful argument in a especially in a more secular society. So yes, I do think it's a strong argument, and I think it has, and part of the subtext, and I'm not explicit about the book, but if you're in a modern, diverse society where appeals, traditional Tory appeals to, well, this is what we all believe, or this is what our culture tells us, are harder to make, naturalizing these kind of arguments by arguments about obligations to the generations, I think is a, is a very good way of maybe putting a narrative that is comprehensible and natural and does not depend on some shared set of religious beliefs or whatever. Yeah, I do think, and that's why I think, that's one of the other reasons why I think this type of argument is striking a chord. It's not just, it's a real problem, it's also the type of political argument that people respond to. Okay, just maybe yellow type, After the race of the was burned, I mean, the race was for a moment in time, he eventually drove the water to the end of the chapter and foresight that he did, so that both villages of the baby boomers can be accommodated by our antiquated sewage system. <laughs> um, having been born in 1950, I'm reminded by a recent birthday cards in that year it took 28 hours from Gregory Peck to fly in from New York. It took 12 hours to go from London to Glasgow over the working week was nearer to 50 hours than 40. Since then, there has been a big time squeeze on everything that we do. I went to uni in 68, took a good degree, felt I had loads of time in which to do that degree. And of course, it was my first experience with the first degree. That was what I thought was important. Everything else seems to have shrunk. And yet, three-year degree delivery remains the dominant mode of delivery albeit in a society that is more IT knowledge based, more helpful to students than ever before. Do you think, David, that 10 years from now, the three year course will remain such a dominant norm? Uh, I think it will, uh, well, on all these things, we have to ensure there is a fair choice for students. The current system doesn't treat two year courses. <coughs> 
especially if they are more intensive, it is a sort of 48 week year for two years. It doesn't, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of this, but there are lots of sort of complicated, hefty rules, which means that it's not finance on a kind of equity basis with a three year course. So I do think we probably need to ensure, I'm sorry to use the cliche, but as a minimum, a kind of level playing field so that young people who want to do their studies more quickly have that opportunity, yes, and I suspect. I suspect more people would want to have that opportunity in the future. There's a lady in the third row back right at the end there. Yeah, I think it's probably a good time to take questions. Yeah, yeah. This is very um, sensitive and delicate about what is happening with the birth rate. Um, I don't think that what you say is quite what the evidence suggests. Uh, my understanding of the evidence is, first of all, I mean, this is in some ways an example of the difference between genders. To put it crudely, I think the more a man earns, the more children he has, and the more a woman earns, the fewer children. In other words, for a man, your income enables you to finance having more kids. For a woman, your earnings mean that the opportunity cost of having children increases as earning as income foregone. So if you've got those two different economic forces operating, which just shows that some of the gender divisions are still in our country, uh, it's a bit more uh, complicated than just kind of more often than having kids. And the other effect is that one way in which women respond to these pressures when they have Careers. There was some research, which I think I read in Population Trends, that uh, more affluent women had a narrower gap between their children. They compressed having the children. Well, don't they also have fewer children? Well, there is also this phenomenon, there is an increase in childlessness and there is some suggestion it may be unintended in that you ask people whether they expect to have children and then fewer end up having children than expect to have. So there are, so there are sort of quite complicated sort of cross-cutting uh, trends here um, but the, uh, and there, are, there are some, there has been some increase in childlessness but I think rather than identifying that as of people being very affluent. I think it's much more to be seen as because advancing into adulthood has become slower and uh, messier. It's, you know, the time to, it takes to kind of create the nest before you then have kids. Creating the nest in terms of owning a place of your own or at least having reasonable accommodation of your own and having um, a reasonably well-paid job or a partner with a reasonably well-paid job, if that all takes longer, you are up against the biological clock. So I think that's more the problem than in terms of a, a simply a difference in age in birth rates by affluence. But I do think that these, but I wrestle with the book, with the dilemma, and I came up with that, perhaps an overage example, but the dilemma I have is of course we can't have an increase in the birth rate going on, even when there are these pressures. And my argument was that paradoxically, the, one of the effects of the house price boom was that people were piling into houses, even with very large mortgages, just to get started on the housing ladder. But I don't claim fully to have got my head around the links between house prices and the, and the birth rate, which has not behaved in the past few years the way I initially expected. Yeah, um, we are quite, quite close to running out of time, so I think we might take a couple of us because we can pick a bunch at once if you don't mind. Um, there's a gentleman with his, I think, a glasses case he's waving in here. Good evening, Edward Von Carter of Jupiter Asset Management. Uh, David, are there lessons from other countries, perhaps developed countries, that have experienced some of these same cycles? You put some uh, other European examples up there. Perhaps I'm thinking of Japan, which is more demographically challenged, it's an earlier stage. In fact, the population is going down just the birth rate, but is actually declining. And they had an asset boom, which, you know, was 
peaked at Argyll in the stock market in the late 80s, and also a real estate boom that peaked early. What are the lessons from other countries and how they deal with some of the issues? And there's a question, I think, in the fourth row on this side. Is Hi, Kieran Larkin from the Centre of Cities. Um, if, you, if your premise is that basically there's been kind of a luck in a certain set of circumstances for the baby boomers, which goes beyond kind of the just general demographic changing uh, nature of, the, of society that we all face, what do you think the theoretical arguments are for perhaps a, a windfall, or an age targeted tax? If you could, would be able to target this, uh, this group and the kind of uh, the additional benefits they've had, notwithstanding the political suicide uh, that we've <laughs> 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 I think there was a, there's a lady in the, right in the middle of the room here. Yeah. Tax. Well, when invited to commit political suicide, uh, I, even I re realised I should not advance into this territory. And, and in fact, I don't think that the solution to these problems is higher tax. I don't think Britain's problem is that we're not paying enough tax. And the aim is to try to be smarter about ways in which we can deliver better fairness between the generations. On Japan, Edward's question about Japan. Yeah, Japan is fascinating. Uh, and I do, and you can argue that there is this underlying parallel, if you look at the kind of growth surge that the economies go through, they go through this growth surge when they're in the sweet spot, but they have a great, when they're, it's like a pig being swallowed by a python. When there's a great big generation in the middle, in the workforce, with not many older people uh, ahead of them with uh, expensive pensions to pay, and not many kids coming on behind, when you've got an age distribution that's concentrated in the middle, you get a growth surge. And that is what uh, is interesting. The, the fascist nations had a, a pronatalist policy, so they had a big increase in the birth rate in the 30s and 40s. So the German and Japanese economic uh, miracles post war were partly driven by being in this very favorable demographics. Then you had uh, uh, Britain and America, and more recently you've had China going through this. So I mean, you danger of becoming kind of demographic determinants, but you can see it in that light. And then you come out the other side when this very large generation gets older and you do have a very serious problem. Uh, and, and Japan, two very interesting things they, they did. I think one of the underestimated measures they took to get out of asset price deflation in Japan was they had a problem that when you had, when you had deflation, when the price index was falling, pensioners whose incomes were denominated in cash terms were in, enjoying real increases in their living standards. And they finally changed the law in Japan uh, that, when, that meant that indexation of pensions could also be negative. 
so that when prices fell, the cash value of the pension fell as well. And that changed the dynamics. And it was only after they changed the law in that way so that you ceased to have a very large group of voters with a significant interest in price deflation. At that point, um, economic policy started delivering that uh, modest Japanese recovery of a few years ago. So you can have perverse effects if you've got negative <coughs> prices and significant groups who are beneficiaries from price rises being made. The other thing that's interesting in Japan, of course, is that they are very wary of allowing migration and have a very strongly ethnic understanding of what it is to be Japanese. They, I think they've identified an obscure group in Mongolia that they're willing to count as ethnically Japanese, but they're pretty uh, uh, fussy about all this. So they haven't got the normal Western solution to adjust, and they are quite explicit when you go there. But one of the things they're trying to do to a, a response to demographic aging is a massive investment in robotics. That robotics is their, one of their big industries for the future, and the reason why Sony and others are so good at robotics is they are trying to make things that will deliver the services that they're not producing the young people to deliver for them. So they are looking to the day when the waiters and the waitresses and the restaurants are robots. Well, there is a that is part of the Japanese demographic response and industrial strategy is this extraordinary faith in, and, and extraordinary effort in, in designing robots. And Tom's, Tom's final point, yet it is ultimately a moral thing, and it is not just a matter of, of assets uh, and the kind of, but it kind of goes back to further questions. So where do you think your morality comes from? Another chapter in the book is an attempt to offer a slightly more naturalistic or kind of human account of morality as emerging from um, exchanges and drawing on the entire literature about kind of evolution of cooperation and arguing again the most important forms of cooperation are intergenerational. And if you imagine that instead of being born into the world dependent and requiring large amounts of education and training to become independent and leaving the world dependent, if you imagine that we emerged into the world as adults and then carried on as adults until suddenly we died without a period of dependence at the end, then most of the institutions that make us human and that hold society together, I think, would not exist. And if you, in my view, is that it's those exchanges between the generations that make the family necessary, that make a large amount of the society necessary. And so it is the intergenerational obligation uh, which I argue in the book is ultimately indeed not just an economic transaction, but is at the heart of most of the moral obligations we have to others as well. What a very good note to end on. Um, thank all of you for your brilliant questions. I think you've covered pretty much everything in the book. David, thank you for sparing your time. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Fascinating to listen to you as ever. And I think we'd all like to show our appreciation. For